All right, we're starting a brand new book of the Bible, 1 Corinthians. Lots of great doctrine in this book. I'm excited to get started on this and to preach through this chapter, or through this book. Um, but let's, let's dig in and start in verse number one. The Bible says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. So the very first verse, of course, this is the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Corinthians. So mainly, this is Paul's letter, but when Paul does his introduction, he's introducing not only himself, but he's also saying it's me and Sosthenes, our brother, right? That is kind of writing this in, in spirit. So I believe that, that this is, the apostle Paul is mainly the one being used and he's doing the writing, but he's saying like this is coming from us. And you'll see in some of the other books too, that also that's not just Paul. That's at the beginning. That's that's you know he's the one who gets the majority of the credit for the for the book. Although of course God gets all of the credit because God's the author. So whether it's coming from Paul and Sosthenes or Paul, not that important because it's all God being the author and He's using these men to um, deliver His word and, and His Scripture unto us. So we see here it says Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. It was God's will that Paul become an apostle. Verse number two, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now we see here this letter is sent to the church at Corinth. And the church consists of those that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, those that are set apart, those that are saved. Basically, when you, when you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're sanctified, you're set apart. God has saved your soul, called to be saints. And that's what the word saint, the word saint comes from. It's derived from sanctified. If you are sanctified in Christ, you are a saint. You see, the Catholic Church believes in these special people that are called saints, right? And they're always voting and adding people who have achieved the level of sainthood in the Catholic Church as if it's like some special high honor degree that you can earn through a lot of good works. But it's just another fallacy of the Catholic Church because if you're a believer, if you're sanctified in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. It is not some extra special term given to someone who works and works and works their whole life to, to being good and following the commandments. Any, every believer is a saint. And, uh, and praise the Lord for that. You know, we don't have to achieve our salvation. Christ has sanctified us. He has set us apart as His children simply because we received the free gift of salvation. But you are a saint. I am a saint. And you know what? That is a good term to use. That is something that ought to be looked on with respect. You know, the Catholics will lift that term up, and, I, and I don't, I'm not trying to bring the term down. They're just misapplying it to people who, you know, as if it's, it's a, a badge of honor because of the work that they've done. I do believe it's a badge of honor, but it's a badge of honor where all the glory goes unto Jesus Christ. Being a saint means you're set apart and a child of God. Hey, praise the Lord. That is, that is something to be very excited about and something that people should, should respect, Right? It is something that, that, that is a, you know, a badge to wear proudly, as it were, that, that you're sanctified, but all the glory goes to God, not to you because of your own works. So it says here, called to be saints. He's writing a letter unto the church, to them that are sanctified, called to be saints. With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And it's interesting, we were just talking about this. We, we were out soul winning this afternoon. We talked to a gentleman who, um, he's not saved, but he had a lot of knowledge. He's an older man and um, a lot of history. He seemed to know a lot about different religions. He seemed to be a guy that studied quite a bit. He wasn't very proud, it didn't seem at least, but he wanted to talk about all kinds of things. And um, as we were going through the Bible, you know, I was trying to explain to him the 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 one true religion because he's bringing up all these different religions and ancient religions and you know oftentimes people get stuck especially people who do a lot of studying and research especially in the world's wisdom which we're going to see a little bit later in this chapter what god thinks about the world's wisdom but he was going on and on about how you know the wise men that came to jesus that were following a star they were really zoroastrians and they followed this other religion even though the bible doesn't say that anywhere but he's relying on the wisdom of this world to just say oh yeah these were people who are of a totally different religion that followed this star because it's part of their religion which is why they came to jesus christ and that's false 
What I was trying to explain is that there are people that lived in other areas of the world that were believers in the Lord. That, you know, you could call them Christians even if Christ wasn't around at that time. There is one true religion. Now, you can call it different. It, it might have changed names over the years. That's not what's important. It's not the label of the name. But the religion itself is true. The religion of worshiping the one true God. He says, yeah, but the, the Muslims believe that there's one God. Yeah, I know, but it's a false religion. Yeah, but they say that, that theirs is the one true religion. Yeah, I know, and they're wrong. And he says, well, everybody says that they have the one true religion. Yeah, but it doesn't make them all right, but it doesn't also make them all wrong either. And what I think he was trying to get at, and, and uh, he was falsely understanding what I was saying, I believe. I was trying to clarify, but he didn't really give us too much time to speak. He kind of wanted to hear himself speak more than he wanted to listen, but, which is unfortunate. But um, what he was tr missing the point, I wasn't trying to say that the Baptist religion is the only true religion. That wasn't the point I was trying to get across because I don't believe that. I believe that today, when you're looking for a good church to go to, you're going to find the most likely chance that a, an independent fundamental Baptist will be the closest to the right thing, right? But all churches are imperfect. Everyone's going to have their own flaws and misunderstandings and, and some thing, some aspect that isn't quite right, even our church, right? Now, if I knew what they were, I'd fix them, but I don't claim that we're completely perfect. But I do believe we're really close. And see, we use the name Baptist as a way to let people know the things that we believe. But I don't, I mean... Obviously, Christians weren't always called Baptists all throughout time. They weren't even always called Christians all throughout time, yet it was the same religion. We see that Adam and Eve, from the very beginning, a sacrifice was made when they were given those skins, a blood sacrifice. They had their faith on God, on the Savior, on the Lord, on Jehovah. That is the same way that Abraham was saved. Read Romans chapter 4. That's the same way that King David was saved. Read Romans chapter 4. It's the same way that people have always been saved all throughout history is by putting their faith in the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today we know the name of Jesus Christ. They didn't always know that name. But I don't care if you want to call that Judaism. It doesn't matter. That label doesn't matter to me. If, that name, if, you, if you change the label from Judaism to Christianity somewhere along the time of, of the death of Christ or the resurrection or, or somewhere in between, look, the label isn't what is as important as the actual religion, as the actual belief, the fundamental doctrines and belief. Belief in the, in the true God that has revealed His words unto us is the one true religion. And this is the point that I was trying to get across. And this is what we see here. So he says, hey, this is under the church of God, which is at Corinth. He didn't say the Baptist church at Corinth. And now we have churches today that are called the church of God. Right? We have the assemblies of God, the church of God, the church of God in Christ. Look, just because it says this here, now that doesn't make them right. The church of God is false. They're, they're unsaved. They're not believers. They believe you can lose your salvation. They are not following the one true religion. They claim the name of Christ, but in their belief, they deny him. They call him a liar because they don't believe the record that God has given of his son. As 1 John chapter 5 lays out, they don't believe that it's eternal life. The name is not what is important here, but as the Apostle Paul says, he's under the church of God, which is at Corinth. So then they're sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. This is who the letter's for. It's for the church at Corinth, the saved, and for everybody, in every place, not just at the church of Corinth, but all over the world, everybody that calls upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. That is who this epistle is written to, and it's for us. Because we've called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. So this epistle is for us. It doesn't matter which specific church. And again, the church name is unimportant, but the doctrine and the teaching is very important. And we use the name Baptist as, as a label, as an identifier mostly, so that people can understand what it is that we believe. But I'm not going to say that you have to be part of a Baptist church or else you're not part of the right... No, I'm not saying that at all. 
There could be other churches with other names that teach the exact same thing that is part of the one true religion. Now, you're not going to find, don't take that all the way the other direction and say, oh, yeah, well, then you could, you know, this Catholic church is teaching. No, you're not going to find a Catholic church teaching the, the right thing. You're not going to find a Pentecostal church teaching the right thing. You're just not going to do it because they are tied into that doctrine. They are part of a denomination that has guidelines of this is what we believe. What I'm referring to is if you find some independent church that's teaching this, then it'll be right, regardless of what the name says on the outside of the building. So church is just a group of believers anyways. It's, it's the sanctified, it's the saints. It's those that call upon the name of Jesus Christ. Continuing on here, look at verse number three. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's look at verse number 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. If you're wondering why I'm kind of skipping over some of this, there's a lot to teach in this chapter. There's a lot that I want to get into. So what I want to focus on right now is this verse number 10 because this is extremely important. What he's teaching here is unity within the church. Now, it's understood that we as individuals are all going to have probably a unique belief system when you really dig down and get into every little detail of the things that you believe. No two people will probably be exactly identical. You might have some nuance, something here that, that well, I believe this a little bit differently, but it's basically the same thing, right? And what he's calling us here to do is that um, in verse number 10, you know, he's beseeching you by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. So there are certain doctrines that are going to divide people, right? Some things are a little bit smaller. Like I mentioned, there's some things that, you know, if you want to talk about end times prophecy, well, I think that, you know, I think that the Babylon is the United States or I think that Babylon is actually Jerusalem or I think that, but you know, that's not going to, that shouldn't at least cause division within the church, right? That is something that you can believe and you could, you could hold to it and you've got your reasons and you say, you know what, I believe this. And I'm just throwing it out there. I mean, this is one example, right? And you could probably find many others like this. But it's not some, some major doctrine that is going to drive you to be divided from people. As, say, for example, you know, does baptism save? Or, you know, can we lose our salvation? Or, you know, what is the word of God? Is it, is it found in the King James Bible? Is it, you know, these are things that are extremely important, right? And this is, you know, we're talking about fundamentals. We're a fundamental Baptist church. The fundamentals, the hardcore principles, the things that everything else is built off of, the deity of Jesus Christ, these are all extremely important things. And he's saying, look, there ought not to be divisions among you. Now, there ought not to be divisions among you, whether it's major or minor doctrine. He said, if you're in a church, we need to come together in unity. We need to have a unified church because it's a body. The local church is a body of Christ. As a body, we can't have a divided house. We can't have a divided body here. We all need to come into agreement. And the things that are taught in this church, if you find yourself just, this is not what I believe in, this is not the right church for you. Because we are not, you need to go join yourself to a group of believers that believe the same thing as you. If, if this is something that's, that's too much, you know, if there's just too much out there that's going to cause a division in the people. 
Now, um, he says, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We need to have the same goals. We need to be uh, having the same doctrine, the same judgment. What judgment is, when you look at the scripture and you're judging what it means, we need to have that same mind here in the church. Now it says in verse 11, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So he's bringing this up because he's already heard that there's some problems going on at the church at Corinth. He's saying, and he's calling out who he heard it from, just so it's all out in the open. It's not some, some whispering. And back where he says, nope, you know what? The household of Chloe, they told me there's problems going on at church. And he says, there's contentions among you. What is contentions? It's fighting, right? There's contending going on between people in the church. And he says in verse 12, Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. So what they're doing is, you know, there's probably some differences in teaching between the Apostle Paul, between Apollos, between, you know, Peter, and between Jesus, even, we're saying, I of Christ. And he says, is Christ divided? The answer is no. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? And he's rebuking him now because people have gotten so hung up on following their one leader that they forget that they all need to be, we all need to be unified in Christ. Right? So I'm a follower of Christ. We say in here is don't lift up any one person because they're all going to have flaws. We see in uh, Galatians when the Apostle Paul confronts Peter, it says because he was to be blamed. He was doing things that were wrong. Right? He was, they were having lunch and sitting with the Greeks and then when, uh, when these other Jews came, then they, they, they separated themselves from the Greeks. And he says, you know what, that's wrong. What you're doing is, is, is sin. You know, how can you, you, know, you can't even keep the law and you're going to put this yoke upon them? Peter was wrong in what he did and he was rebuked for it. But see, the Apostle Paul wasn't perfect either. You remember when he went back um, to Jerusalem and he went into the temple and they're saying, look, all these people, they're saying that you don't, you know, you're throwing out the law of Moses. Now we just want you to show them that you still believe in the law of Moses so that why don't you go into the temple? There's other people that have a vow. Why don't you go in with them and just put this to rest and put this to silence, what people are saying bad about you? And he listened to them and he did it. Now, what they were doing is they were accomplishing the vow of the Nazarite. And what he did was he shaved his head, as the other people did at the accomplishment of a vow. And what they do is they shave their head until a sacrifice could be made. The apostle, but look, is there supposed to be any more animal sacrifices after Jesus Christ shed his blood and rose again from the dead? No, that was done away with. And the apostle Paul knew it, yet he still went and... and brought himself in because he was under pressures and he buckled and, and he sinned by going in and doing that. He was wrong. Look, every leader, you're going to find something that they do where they sin, where they're wrong because a person is not perfect. So you need to be careful. Now look, I mentioned this already on Sunday and it's a good thing to follow a person, right? But he said, follow me even as I follow Christ. Christ is the ultimate leader in the example. Christ is the head of this church. I am not the head of this church. You can look at other pastors. They are not the head of those churches. Christ is the head of every church. So we need to be unified in Christ and ultimately follow Christ. Now, if I'm following Christ, then there's nothing wrong with following me. And see how I do think, hey, is he following Christ's example? Great, you could follow me then because I'm getting my lead from Christ, but he is the ultimate head. The problem is when you put too much stock and too much investment in any one man, when that person stops following Christ, if they stop following Christ, you don't want to follow along with them. You need to be able to make sure that you have your own relationship, so to speak, with God, that you have your own founding in God's word. 
Yes, you could learn from teachers, you could learn from preachers, you could go to church, learn from the pastor, but be able to recognize what is from Christ and what is not. When is the, the teaching coming directly from God's word and when is it an opinion? And when someone starts to go wrong and he's saying, look, this is not something to fight over. So what, a good example, if we all put this in the present tense, in something that I can see happening as the movement that we have going on, because there is, there is this amazing movement that's going on right now in churches. There are people that are getting back to the fundamentals and the roots of the Bible. And there's a big push for this because people are getting sick. There's a lot of people getting fed up and sick of the wishy-washy churches out there that won't preach on anything, that don't want to offend, and people are just yearning and desiring to hear the truth, that someone will just stand up and preach, thus saith the Lord, and actually have it come from the Bible and use the Bible and the preaching and not just go off on one little verse and talk for an hour. People are getting sick of that. And there's been great inspiration from a few men of God that are out there today that are inspiring a lot of people now to get serious about serving the Lord. And praise God for that. I am glad that we're in a time that's so exciting as this in the end days that he's pouring out, I believe he's pouring out a blessing on, on, on preachers definitely in the United States. I don't know about the rest of the world, but I know here there are a few groups that are, that are making a big push to say, you know what, let's be zealous for God. Let's, let's do things the way that the Bible says to do things. Let's be separated from this world. Let's not be among them. Let's be separate. Let's live a separate lifestyle. Let's preach every word of God and let's also do it. But I can see this happening now where there's some differences. Right now, we've got a lot of great pastors. We've got Roger Jimenez in Sacramento. We've got Pastor Anderson in Tempe. We've got Pastor Romero at uh, Steadfast. And there's plenty of others that are, that are coming out also and becoming very strong and solid uh, uh, Bible-teaching churches. Okay, I name those name a few because there's a lot of people, even that listen to our sermons online, that might listen to these other people also. And what might happen is you say, oh, well, I heard this person say something a little bit different. Or that person, he said something a little bit different, right? And what well, we don't want that to have happen, especially within this church. Now, you talk to people from other churches and stuff, whatever. They could believe whatever they want to believe. They're not part of this church. So when there's the division, if there's a division between two churches, okay, they're not the same bodies. They're two different bodies. We have a body here. Christ is our, they're following Christ, you know, to, to, with what they believe to be true. The division is within our church. So what we don't want to have happening, though, is people within our church saying, oh, yeah, well, I, I heard you know, Pastor Romero say this. Well, I heard Pastor Anderson say this. And, you know, well, I follow Anderson. Well, I follow Romero. I follow, you know, and like having this division then becoming a problem within the church because people are saying, well, I believe it, you know, as if that matters. They're saying, no, look, it doesn't matter what the man says, what the, the, the different pastor says and what they teach. What matters is what's actually found in the Bible. And we ought to be able to have this unity where we say, you know what, Christ is our head. Now, you could have disagreements on some doctrine, but we don't want it to cause a contention, a striving to where all of a sudden there's going to be a rift in the church. The church needs to be unified as brothers and sisters in Christ, as a, as a, as a body that has an objective. We can't have two different parts of the body wanting to do two different things and being in conflict with each other. You know, the body needs to be unified in order to be at its full potential to do the work that God has laid out for the body of this church. And he specifically calls them out. And I mean, he's saying, look, was Paul, was I crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? It's all about Christ. Stop lifting up a man to some super high level and putting him on a pedestal to the point to where it looks like you're worshiping them instead of worshiping Christ. Amen. And I have a lot of respect for all of those pastors that I named. I really do. And I think they're great teachers, but I am not going to lift anyone up on the pedestal to just say that, oh, I'm following this person. I'm going to follow Christ. 
Now, I know this isn't a problem that I'm aware of within our church, but hopefully it never does become a problem. But it was a problem in the church of Corinth. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And he's just saying, look, I'm, I'm glad that there's only been a couple baptisms that I performed because I don't want people lifting me up so much to basically be taking the place of Christ where someone might even say that I've been baptizing people you know, after me and getting my own followers. Right? John the Baptist did it right. John the Baptist had a great following of people following him. Right? He was a powerful preacher. He was a great man of God. But what did he do? He pointed everyone to Christ. He's saying, that's the man you need to follow right there. And that was his whole job. And that's the job of every pastor and teacher and preacher. It's pointing people to Christ. Not to themselves, not to amass some cult following after themselves. And that's what these cult leaders do. They try to gather just people to themselves so they could have their own little flock that they could you know, teach whatever to, but where they're the leader and they're the authority, not God, not Christ, not the Word. Which those three are one, by the way. Let's, uh, let's keep reading here. So he's saying, I'm glad I didn't baptize people just so that you can't accuse me that I was baptizing people in my own name. Verse 17, very critical verse. This is a verse, if you, if you ever talk to people like Pentecostals or people who believe that you must be baptized in order to be saved, this is a great verse to bring them to. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, as the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. If baptism is necessary for salvation, why in the world would the Apostle Paul be in saying, Christ didn't send me to baptize. So Paul wasn't being sent for people to get saved. He said, but to preach the gospel. Well, what is preaching the gospel? It's getting people saved. That was the whole purpose. That's what Paul was sent to do. What good would preaching the gospel be if baptism was also required for salvation. And he says, well, Christ didn't send me to baptize. Well, then what is Christ doing? What kind, of, what kind of Christ is that to send somebody to preach a gospel and not baptize them if baptism is a requirement for salvation? It makes no sense whatsoever. None. So if you like to highlight verses, I would, I would highlight this one. Or, or you know, One of the things that I had done before kind of having a lot of these scriptures memorized and, and uh, easily um, available at my fingertips, verses that I like to use, what I would do, and I don't, I don't have it in this Bible because it's been a while since I've needed those kind of notes, but what I did was I had little columns on a on like the back page of my Bible, like this one's falling out, but like you know, every, pretty much every Bible should have blank pages in, in the bind, near the binders. And what I would do is I would say, okay, JW, right? I would do Mormon, I would do Pentecostal, and, and all of the different people that you might run into out soul winning. And I would write down just a real quick note, you know, like baptism. And then like different verses that would deal with that so I can show people, you know, for the Pentecostal, hey, baptism isn't required. And I recommend you doing that. And this is a great verse to show people that do believe that baptism is a requirement for salvation because it's so clear. Why wouldn't Christ send him to baptize but to preach the gospel if it was a requirement for salvation? Now, Real quickly, I just want—I like to prove these things a little bit more. Sometimes I'm gonna go a little bit in depth into this. Um, Acts chapter two is the the probably the most famous place that you're gonna be asked to turn to by someone that believes that baptism is a requirement for salvation. Acts two thirty-eight, right? But we'll start reading in verse uh, thirty-six. The Bible says. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So Peter's preaching this sermon, right? And, he, and he's railing on me. He says basically that, look, 
You guys need to know that that Jesus, right, the same Jesus, God made Jesus Christ Lord and Christ. And yeah, that's the same guy that you crucified, the one that you wanted to be nailed to that cross. God made him Lord. God made him Christ. So they hear this and they're pricked to their hearts. They're saying, wow, we did that, right? They're convicted of what they had done. What, we did that. Well, what, what should we do? What should we do about this? And he answers them. It says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So he says, Repent. Repent. Now, does he say, Repent of your sins? No. It's repent. You need to change. You need to change what you believe. You need to rethink. Now, you didn't know that before that he was the Savior. Now you know he's a Savior. You need to repent. You need to believe on him. And we'll get to that in just a minute because the John the Baptist preached the same exact thing. Repent first because everybody needs to be saved. You need to be a believer on Jesus Christ before you get baptized. So he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, the reason why this is so misunderstood is because they take this verse and say, see, you need to be baptized for the remission of sins. And they believe that means in order to receive remission of sins, in order for your sins to be remitted, to be put away, you need to be baptized. That's their understanding of this in English. The problem is they just, there's one word in here that they don't understand, and it's that word for. And I've used this example many times. So if you have someone that says wanted for murder, that doesn't mean you have someone that's wanted in order to murder somebody. They're wanted because of what they had done. So that word for here just means because of. So when we get baptized, it's because of the remission of sins. So he says, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, because of the remission of sins, because you've believed. So because you've believed, you've received remission of your sins, now you need to be baptized to show that. To show that you believe that Christ was died, buried, and rose again from the dead. And that's where your faith is resting, is on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did. And your sins are remitted. But see, what people don't even realize, and if people want to bring you here, you could say, oh, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. Let's get this in context. Why don't we jump up a little bit to verse number 21? Because verse number 21 says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and is baptized shall be saved. It just says whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And of course, Romans 10 gives you a much further explanation of that. Now, again, what they asked him is what shall we do? What should we do is basically what they're saying. What should we do? Well, what, what is a good thing for us to do? Right? What shall we do? Repent and be baptized. Hey, that's what you should do. They could have added and go to church. They could have added and keep God's commandments. Those are all things that they should do, right? I mean, are they not? Are they not things that they should do? If you were to ask me, hey, what should I do? Well, if you're not saved, you should get saved. Then you should get baptized. Then you should go to church and you should live a godly life. And you know what? You should also tell other people about Christ. Those are all things that I'll tell you are things that you should do. But you know what the, act, the book of Acts also says? There's a man that asks a question. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? There's a difference between what should I do? What should we do? And what must I do? If you want to know what is required for salvation, maybe you ought to look at the verse that says, what must I do to be saved, which is also found in the same book. Just a little bit later, Acts chapter 16, there's a man that asked the question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And the house. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you need to do. That's what you must do. They didn't say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. People say, oh yeah, but he went and he baptized them. Yeah, he did. But the answer to the question remains the same. Just because he went and baptized them doesn't mean that that somehow was required for salvation too. No. He asked the question. They answered it. They left out baptism. And if baptism required, then they lied to that man when they said, if you believe, thou shalt be saved. That is a statement that stands alone. 
Real quickly, uh, you don't have to turn if you want to, but in Mark, uh, Mark chapter 1, we see an example of John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. See, but John the Baptist even taught, taught repentance, and that's a whole other thing. About, uh, you know, people will say that, that you need to turn from your sins in order to be saved. Baptism of repentance. Well, Paul defines exactly what John was preaching when he taught the baptism of repentance in Acts 19.4. The Bible says in Acts 19.4, then said Paul, and this is, you know what, this is another good reference to have for, for repent of your sins, people, if you want to make this note, because there's a lot of people that have, um, that are hung up on the repent of your sins doctrine. Uh, in addition to Jonah 3.10, Jonah 3.10 is huge. I always use Jonah 3.10 because that defines um, turning from your wicked ways as being works. So turning from your evil way, turning from your sins is works. That's Jonah 3.10. We're not going to go there tonight, but you could write that down. This place is also good because if you want to bring up what John, John the Baptist, he, he taught repentance. They'll say, Jesus taught repentance. John the Baptist taught repentance. Yes, they did. Absolutely they did. But your definition of repentance is wrong. Paul tells us what it was. Acts 19, verse 4. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is, on Christ Jesus. That was the preaching of the baptism of repentance, that the people believe on Christ. That's it. That is the baptism of repentance, believing on Jesus Christ. That's the repentance that's necessary for salvation. Changing what you believed that was wrong onto what is correct, which is Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation as your Savior. Real simple doctrine, but people get screwed up on that. And these are great verses. That's what I said. There's so many great verses in here and so many different reasons. So hopefully you are paying, you know, you're writing these things down because we're going to get into our next different issue and there's a lot of there's a whole host of topics just dealt with in this one chapter first corinthians chapter one if you get if you don't have your notes or something and there's something that comes up first corinthians one has a lot of different things in it that you can go to 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 prove different doctrines uh, look at verse number 18 well, we'll read again, verse 17 says for christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So, you know, when he preaches the gospel, he's not using his great intellect and his great you know, orations and his wisdom of words to get people. No, he says, then I'm just, you know, removing the effect of the cross of Christ. The, the cross of Christ, that's where the power is. The word of God is where the power is. It's not my words that's going to persuade people. It's, it's the power of God. Verse number 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. He's saying the preaching of the cross, because he said this is where the power is. The power is in the preaching of the cross. But to those that perish, they think it's foolishness. They think it's stupid that you're preaching about, you know, what Jesus did on the cross. He says, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. We know the power in the cross of what Jesus did for us. That is power. Now, the reason why this verse is so important, and I want you to make note of this verse, is because this verse is corrupted pretty much universally in every other version of the Bible besides the King James Version. If you get into a discussion with somebody about the King James Bible being the Word of God, if they don't have a King James Bible, you could have them turn to this passage and it doesn't matter what Bible they have, and it's going to be wrong. To the best of my knowledge, I don't know of any that, that, that translate this correctly and maintain the integrity of this verse. Now, I have copied here the passage, the same exact passage from the NIV, the ESV, the New American Standard, and the New King James Version. See, what I like about memorizing and knowing this verse is a good place to turn to. If you memorize any verse, memorize this one. Because even people who have a new King James Version, this is a big deal. This is a big difference to them. This one especially, and I'll show you why in a minute. I'll read for you from the NIV. 
The, Bible, the NIV says, this verse 18, for the message, of course, it's not the preaching, right? It's just the message. That's so why the liberal churches these days will say, oh, it's a great message. Oh, it's great preaching. You know, preaching, you know what? These liberal churches, they do just have a message. Well, I've got a message for you. Instead of, I'm going to go and hear some preaching from a man of God. The Bible says the preaching of the cross. Here it just says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The ESV, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The New American Standard, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And the New King James, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know what's interesting about that? The New King James and IV are identical word for word. Hmm. But that's the New King James? Looks like the NIV to me. Did you notice what they all said? They all agreed. They're all in agreement. They said, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you being saved today? Or have you already been saved? See, I was saved the moment that I prayed and called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and I put my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I was saved on that day. You know what? I am saved today. I am not being saved. I am not in some process of salvation where I'm still being saved. I'm still getting sins. I'm still turning from some sins. I'm still doing whatever it is I need to do in order to make it, in order to achieve salvation. But look at what all these perversions teach. Now, normally when I point out the, the, the fact that the King James Bible is the preserved Word of God, with someone who has an NIV, this isn't the first verse I turn to. They have problems with this doctrine anyways. I turn to some, some more blaring things like, hey, this whole verse is missing like in Acts chapter 8. And you can actually see it goes from verse 36 to verse 38 and verse 37 is missing, which is the answer to why can't I be baptized. That's a pretty big problem in that book. That's the one I like to show people. But if you only memorize one, this is great because this is a huge difference. I mean, this is all the difference in the world. You say, oh, th these differences don't affect doctrine. Uh, you, salvation is kind of important, I think. Getting people screwed up about what salvation even is, if you're being saved or if you've been saved, you are saved. That's a big deal. And the people who use the New King James Version typically, typically will be a lot closer to our beliefs anyways. You'll find people who are kind of more students where well, they really like the King James, but they kind of want something a little bit newer, at least in their mind. You know, this is, this is what a lot of people have this mentality thinking, yeah, well, the New King James, you know, it's corrected a couple things. It's a little bit easier to understand. So I like, but it, but it still stays real close to the King James Bible because I like the King James Bible. So this is kind of the mentality of a lot of people that use the New King James Version. But when you could show them this, and I've had this happen plain, there have been people who have come to our church, and as soon as I preached a sermon on the, on the New King James Version, they threw theirs away, got rid of it. And, and got the, because this is important, because they have respect for the Word of God. And they don't want to use some corrupt, adulterated version that's going to be teaching lies and teaching heresy and leaving the impression that salvation is somehow a process as opposed to a one time event like, oh, maybe a birth, like a new birth. Amen. As the Bible puts it, you're born on one day. I, my salvation took place in an instant. The moment I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I was born that day. It was a spiritual birth for me. I'm not being born. Continue. Oh, all these years later, I'm still in that process, still being saved, still being born. No, I was born. I am saved. This is an important verse. Not to mention, it's just a great verse anyways. Right? For the preaching of the cross is them that perish foolishness, but on us which are saved is the power of God. Amen. The power of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in that cross where he suffered and bled and died for us. Let's keep reading. For it is written, verse 19, 
For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now, I, I always like to try to do this, especially when I'm preparing on the Bible study sermons. And this is something I suggest for you to do when you are studying the Bible, not just reading, but when you're studying. You notice in verse 19 it says, For it is written. When he's referring to that, it's referring back to an Old Testament scripture. So I like trying to find out, well, where did it say this, right? And this particular verse is found in Isaiah 29, verse number 14. You could turn there if you'd like to see it, and you could just keep your finger in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, Isaiah 29, 14. So what he said in, in verse 19, he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And in Isaiah 29, 14, the Bible says, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. So he's saying, this is something that's coming from God. God's saying, the wisdom of the wise men, it's going to be, it's going to be brought to nothing. It's going to die. It's going to perish. It's going to be good for nothing. And the understanding of their prudent, these wise men in the world, their wisdom is going to be hid. They're not going to be able to understand this. And this is exactly, you know, this is the quote that he's saying where he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. All the, you know, you take the wisest men in the world and it's foolishness. They can't understand the things of God. They look at them and they say, that's foolishness. They look at us and say, oh yeah, your faith is foolish. Right? But in reality, they're the foolish ones. You know, why do so many people exalt the wisdom of this world? There are literally people who are career students because they exalt this world's wisdom so much. They put it, they put that, that's their idol. They put this, the world's wisdom on a pedestal and just thinking like, I just want to keep going and learning all these different things. Hey, I'm all for learning. But that's what they place. It's, it's human knowledge that they place above the knowledge of God of what they, you know, what they want to invest their time doing. And what's funny is that to God, it's all foolishness. This world's wisdom. And this world's wisdom, look at verse 21. The Bible says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. So this is where the world's wisdom will get you to you or where it won't get you is to God, right? The world's wisdom cannot lead you to God. The world's wisdom is going to tell you that there was this big bang. The world's wisdom is going to tell you that, yeah, we don't really know what, like, there was some explosion, an explosion of nothing that produced everything. We believe that there was this explosion, and then, and then we believe that, uh, you know, all these, these plant, you know, these matter was, was tossed about and some of it came together and formed planets. And then these planets, just over a long period of time, you know, there were these, these stars came out of that matter and they started orbiting around and, the, you know, gravity was pulling them around. And then, and then there was like, you know, really nothing on the planet and it rained for a long time and there was some lightning and somehow there's this life just kind of sparked out of nothing. Abiogenesis, just, just life just began. It just started. You know, there's all these different elements and lightning and you know, add electricity and then all of a sudden, you know, like Frankenstein, hey, it's going to come to life. Right? There's just all these raw materials that just became extremely complex in an instant. And then that one time that that one thing came alive, it actually stayed alive long enough to be able to reproduce, or this same miraculous event just kept happening, just over and over and over again. And then all of a sudden that evolved into something even extremely much more complex, just some, just by chance, I mean, over billions of years. You know, you give it enough time, it'll, it'll just happen. It'll, things will start to just change. And then it goes on and on into, they turn into animals and they turn into us. And, you know, this is where we came from. 
And that's what the wisdom, that's what, that's what all of the, the professors down at the university and these really smart people are going to teach you. That's the world's wisdom. We can look at that and say, that's foolishness. The wisdom of the world, it says, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. See, that's what prevents people from, from coming to God and just getting true wisdom and knowledge from the Bible. Because they say, oh, no, 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 this is how things happen. And we came from monkeys, see? Because we're so similar. I saw a monkey, you know, banging a rock on the ground and using it as a tool. And we must have come from them because they have some kind of, of limited intelligence. It's foolishness. The Bible says it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. They think I'm up here wasting my time today. And I'm preaching about some fairy tale, unicorns and rainbows and you know some imaginary spaghetti monster in the sky and they call all kinds of derogatory names and will want to make fun of, of what you believe, but you know what? They're the foolish ones. They are the fools. And it says, hey, it pleased God to use something like preaching, going out and just talking to people and, and tell them about Jesus Christ, that that is the mechanism, that is the method that God has used for people to get saved. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That is the way that people get saved, by the way. It's not from opening up a booklet. It's not from opening up the Bible. It's not from opening up a gospel tract and reading. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It comes from a preacher that is sent to preach the gospel of peace. That is where people get saved. And hey, it pleased God by the foolish of the preaching to save them that believe. But see, the world by wisdom knew not God. That verse, this verse here, verse 21, reminds me of Romans chapter 1, right? Because it says, the world by wisdom knew not God. The, uh, Romans uh, 1 22 says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The fools of this earth are the ones they profess themselves, oh, I'm so smart, they get haughty and lifted up in their pride and arrogance and the wisdom of this world, and they think they're so smart, and they're, they don't even know it, and they're fools. One day they'll realize it. Hopefully they'll realize it before they die and repent of their, of their idol of, of knowledge and wisdom in this world to, to put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, because if they don't do that, they will find out what fools they were on Judgment Day. And see, there's this belief in false science that caused people to doubt God's word. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Don't let these oppositions of science that are falsely so-called, false science, people who think they have this, this science and data to back them up and to prove why your religion is stupid and that it can't be true, don't let yourself even get caught up into that. He say, that's why he says here to avoid it. Avoid these opposite. You know, let the fools be fools. Okay? And don't let that shake your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because what they're doing is using a false science anyways. And a lot of people who are unlearned and don't know that much about it can be easily deceived and tricked into thinking, oh, wow, yeah, well, this is science. This is data. So, that might, no, no. They're, what, they're doing, what they're doing is very cleverly using their smoke and mirrors that they call science to tell you to try to disprove the Bible in many cases, right? I'm all for real science, but real science, that things that can be, they can be tested and proved and, and demonstrated, never contradicts the Bible, not even one time, not in one place. Why? Because the Bible's truth. It says, which some have professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee, amen. So, um, Let's get back here to, to Romans or 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm almost done here. Let's try to speed things up a little bit. What else do I have left? Let's look at verse number 22. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, too many Christians today are like the Jews. Now, when he says here the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, he's not praising either one of them for this, because look what it says in verse 23. But we pre preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. So he's saying, the Jews, they're hung up on seeing a sign. Right? We need a sign. What sign does that show? You know, they're always asking Jesus, what sign are you going to show us? Right? They're always looking for a sign. And that's a hang-up for them. They shouldn't have been doing that. And just as the Greeks 
They're seeking after wisdom. And the wisdom of this world that we just got done reading is foolishness to God. Both of them need to humble themselves unto Christ crucified. That's what I said. But we preach Christ crucified. So even Jesus Christ himself, you know, said, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed in Matthew 16, verse 4. He said, A wicked and adulterous generation is going to seek after a sign. Don't be seeking after signs. And too many Christians today are wanting, you know, they want to make a decision. Well, I need to get a sign from God before I do something. I was talking to a friend I remember many years ago before I started pastoring. A guy I like a lot. I still like him. He's a good guy, a great man of God. I, I, I like him a lot. And um, great, you know, he's got a, a nice family, loves the Lord, wants to get into the ministry. But he told me once, he's like, yeah, he's like, well, I, I kind of, I kind of want to be a missionary. I want to do this, but I'm, I'm waiting, you know, for a sign from God. And I'm just thinking, you know, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Look, if you know that this is God, do you think God wants you to be leading people to Christ somewhere in this world where you could bring them to the Savior and bring them to Christ? And why aren't you doing it? I mean, yeah, of course the answer is yes. How could the answer be No. And people struggle with this. Well, I need to know what God's will is in my life. Well, then open up the Bible and see what it says. And if what you want to do isn't contradicting God's word, then how can it not be God's will? And I'll tell you this, if it truly isn't God's will for some reason, if he truly has some other plan for you, why don't you just trust that he'll just not make it possible for you to do whatever it is that you want to do? That's the approach that I took, at least when I started this church. I said, God... I know that, that you want more preachers to be preaching your word and standing up for the truth. God, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to, to sacrifice myself, to yield my body, a living sacrifice unto you, dear Lord. This is what I want to do. This is what I see from the scripture. I see that, that you know, would to God that all of God's people would, would be prophets. I see that this seems to be a good thing. You say if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. Lord, this is what I intend on do. If this isn't what you want me to do for some reason, then just make this impossible because this is what I'm going forward with and doing because it looks like the right thing to me. If you take that type of approach, then you could get started doing work for God. I don't think God is displeased that we're over here now and winning souls and we've won a, a couple hundred people to the Lord already in the existence that we've had here. I think that's a good thing. I think God thinks that's a good thing. I don't have to worry about am I in God's will. I don't have to wait for some special sign to just know this is where, you know, I don't have to look at a map and be like, oh, I see a glowing spot right here. That must be a sign from God. No. I'm just going to start doing what I see to be the will of God and do that. We don't need to be seeking after a sign. Seek his words and do this. Don't worry about a sign. See, that was a stumbling block unto the Jews. So you're seeking a sign, you're not even going to get one. The sign that they got was a sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So that's a sign you're going to get. It's going to be my death, burial, and resurrection, which is the gospel. That's what you get. That's your sign. You want a sign for salvation? Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It already happened. It says in verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. He's saying here, look, God loves to use the underdog. The one that's weak, the people that, you know, the people that don't have all this maybe natural talent and ability. Well, see, of course he's a good pastor because he's always been really good at leading people around. You know, look, God's not as interested in that. 
I'm not saying God can't use a person like that, but where God gets the glory is the person that's the introvert, that's weaker and scared and doesn't want to do things, you know, that, that's, that's afraid to get up in front of people. And then God can use that person and you can see the power of God in that person's life when they get up and preach the word of God boldly because the power and the strength is coming from the spirit of God and not from their own abilities. People are fearful to go out soul winning and say, I don't really know. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to. Look, you don't need to be fearful. And, and, if, and if that's the case, God is going to be able to use you so much more powerfully. If you feel like you're weak and you're not good at any of that stuff, I'm not good at explaining things. Hey, God's going to use you. Because that's what God likes. He likes to use the weak things. He likes to use, he used for his nation Israel because they were the smallest people in all the world. Hey, God chose the smallest group of people. You know, people are despised and hated and say, I'm going to use this small group and I'm going to build a great mighty nation out of them because that gives so much more glory and honor unto God. And this is kind of the main point of this chapter. And verse number 29 really brings it home. Why, why does God use all of the, you know, the base things which are despised, you know, the things that are weak, the, the foolishness of this world? Why does he use all of that? Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. I'll tell you right now, I have no reason to glory before God at all for any of the things that, that, that he's allowed me to do and the strength that he's given me to do the things and even just the ability to stand before you right now and publicly preach God's word. This has not come from my own power at all. God is the one who has changed me and used me. He gets all the glory. I'm just a weak vessel, and he's the one that is getting honor unto his name through this preaching. It's not, it has nothing to do with me, and just like so many other people, this is the reason why he uses the weak and the small, because God doesn't want any flesh to glory in his presence. It's not you that did it. It's God. If anything good is being done, it's God. It says in verse 30, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You want to boast about something? You want to brag about something good, about the spiritual things? You know, they don't brag about, oh, I got this many people say, oh, look, glory and praise be unto God. And if, if, you know, it's always a little bit uncomfortable for me. And, it, you know, when people come up after service and say, oh, man, that was such a great sermon. Oh, that was so, you know, because I, I don't deserve any credit. And I understand what people are saying. Look, I've been in sermons. I've heard that. I thought were great sermons. I go up after and say, hey, that was really great. That helped me out a lot. You know, thanks. But ultimately, that's not, the credit doesn't go to me. I didn't write this book. I'm just preaching what it says. You know, if you get something out of the message, praise the Lord. Because he's the one that's helping you. He's the one that has the wisdom. I'm just repeating it. All the glory and credit goes unto God. Praise God. Praise God for his great words. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that you give us, dear Lord. I thank you personally for working in my life and helping me to do the things that you've led me to do, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us all to, to not get sidetracked or stuck on looking for a sign Dear God, but that we can just read your words and understand what it is that you want us to do with our life. It, it shouldn't be very complicated. You're, you left us with your words that isn't very complicated. There's, there's a few things that you require of us to do. And Lord, help us just to, to do them. Just to get started on serving you, dear God, and not making things so complicated in our life. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to become better soul winners and teachers of your word and that we would remember some of the things that we learned tonight and be able to put them into use uh, as we go out soul winning, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.